We're going to read from Luke today. Luke chapter 6, just a few verses. Luke 6, starting at verse 46. It's a parable of two builders. So Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a wise man, or a man rather, building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. That's where we'll stop today. A house's foundation will make it either stand or fall. Foundation is really important to a house. And especially when you have lots of flooding in your area, that can be make or break your house. If you ever go on the coast where there's oceans and lots of hurricanes, such as there are in Texas, you have these houses that are built on stilts. So when the storm surge comes through, it doesn't take the house with it. It's always interesting to be in a different place and see how the houses are built differently over there because of the different challenges that they might face. So when you're talking about building a house and you're talking about making a a foundation, this is actually a very detailed science here. So I found this little diagram. It's, there's a lot of details that go into making a foundation for building a house. You have to dig down below the frost. I, uh, I talked to someone who will remain nameless about uh, what, how to build a foundation here. Somebody who knows a lot more than I do. Uh, you have to dig below the frost line and then pour concrete with rebar. And uh, if you're in a low area, such as Blendon here, you have to bring in dirt so that the water table stays lower than the house. And to dig below the frost line, you have to dig about 42 inches or so, I'm told. So that's, what, that's what's going on there. And if you skip the foundation, let's say you just want to cut some corners and save some expenses. So if you skip the foundation, your house will eventually sag, bag, and crack and it will fall apart, and everything would shift with the temperature and the moisture changes that are there. That's that's here. This is in a temperate climate. If you're in a desert climate, it's a little bit different. In Palestine, where Jesus is speaking here, solid rock is everywhere, but it's beneath the soil. So there's soil above and there's solid bedrock underneath and depending on where you are it could be an inch of soil or it could be feet of soil so in Israel or in Palestine villagers they'd only build in, in the summer excuse me so the rains come in winter and the ridge on which Jerusalem Bethlehem and Hebron sit occasionally it has snow so nobody wants to build a house in the winter, especially when you're making it out of stone. The summer provides dry, warm days that are suitable for building houses, but there is one downside. During the summer, the soil, with its high clay content, is like bronze. The clay gets really hard and firm in the summer. So when Jesus is telling this parable, it would be pretty easy for these people here, many of them who have probably built their own houses or been involved with building houses. It's easy to imagine a builder in the summer with little imagination or wisdom who thinks that he can build an adequate one-level house on hard clay because it's very solid. So with his pick, he tries digging and finds that the ground is indeed like bronze. 
The walls will not be more than seven feet high, and it's really hot out. The idea of long days of back-breaking work under a hot, cloudless sky doesn't really appeal to him. So he opts to build a simple one- or two-room house on the hardened clay. The underlying rock is down there somewhere, so it'll all work out. He constructs a roof with a reasonable overhang and is pleased that he has managed to finish before the onset of the rains. But that winter, there is more rain than anyone can remember and the ground rapidly becomes soaked. A small runoff stream starts to flow down his street and the ground begins to turn into the consistency of chocolate pudding. The clay under the stone walls of his newly built house begins to settle and buckle as a result. The stones are uncut field stones. So one stone after another pops out of the wall. A serious bulge develops in one wall. The bulge expands and finally gives way, bringing down the entire structure. So this would be pretty easy to imagine for the people who Jesus was talking to here. But Jesus is talking a little bit more about building a house. He's borrowing some imagery that is in the Old Testament that all of his hearers would have recognized. So there's certain kinds of imagery that people groups have where if you say something, certain things immediately come to mind. So for example, if I said stars and stripes, you'd probably think of the American flag, not just any old stars and stripes. If I said White House, you'd probably think of the place where the president lives because these are images that are in this group of people. Jesus used images here that would be recognizable to this group of people. This story uses the imagery of Isaiah 28. This is your Bible reading track for today. In Isaiah 28, there are two shelters. There's a water or storm that's against the shelter. There's a mention that the foundation is very critical, and there's also a a call to hear the word. So building on stone, a foundation, and withstanding weather would remind people of Isaiah 28. And I have just one part of that on the screen. It says, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. This, this verse will actually be quoted a number of times in the New Testament. There's kind of an allusion to it here. What is this stone? What's Isaiah talking about? What is this stone in Zion, that precious cornerstone that is a sure foundation where your trust can be placed and you will not be disappointed? What is that stone? When Jesus was around, there was a lot of debate about what that stone was. The place where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls is a place called Qumran, and they had a lot of writings. This is what they said. In the council of the community, there shall be 12 men and three priests, perfectly versed in all that is revealed in the law, whose works shall be truth, righteousness, justice, loving kindness, and humility, And when these are in Israel, it shall be that tried wall, that precious cornerstone, whose foundations shall neither rock nor sway in their place. So according to Qumran, that stone in Zion is a group of people who lead the community, who are well versed in the law, and who practice it. If you have that, that's your cornerstone where you can place your trust and you will not be disappointed. So Qumran thought the stone was their upright leaders. But there was other ideas about what that stone was too. Jewish tradition, or basically the people who would become the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Jewish tradition thought the stone was the temple foundation. In other words, where the temple sat in Jerusalem, Zion, It sat on this stone there. And there's one particular part 
of the temple that's called the most holy place where only the high priest enters once a year. And when he goes in there, he, he takes this steaming pot with him and he lays it there's, on this stone in this most holy place. It kind of comes up a little bit above the ground. And so he lays this pot on that stone. And this represents coming into the presence of God. So this stone is kind of being in God's presence. God is this, this stone. This Actually, more like this temple is that stone. If you put your trust in the temple, you will not be disappointed. So this parable is actually Jesus saying a little more than just do what I say. He's making a claim about himself. Jesus is making a radical claim that he himself is that stone. I'm that stone. He is that foundation stone. In other words, Isaiah was talking about me when he was saying that. You've heard what other people had to say about it? Forget about that. They're talk, Isaiah was talking about me. In other words, don't trust just your human leaders. Don't trust the temple building. Jesus is more upright than anyone. There's no council or group of people, however upright and righteous and good and true and versed in the Bible, that could match the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is more upright than anyone. That group of people that Qumran thought, hey, you put your trust in these group of people who are well-versed in the law, you won't be disappointed. It wasn't too long before that group of people was completely destroyed. And their, their whole way of thinking, the Essene way of thinking, is gone. That was not a foundation worth trusting at all. Jesus is the true temple of God. In the book of John, they asked him, what miraculous sign can you do to tell us that you have the authority to do all this? And Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it again. And they thought he was talking about the building of the temple. And they say it's taken us so many years to build this temple. What makes you think you can build it in three days? And then it says, but the temple he spoke of was his body. Jesus is the true temple of God. The building was destroyed and leveled in 70 AD. In fact, one stone was not even left on top of another. It's gone. Completely destroyed. So while Qumran is gone and the temple is gone, Jesus is still alive. Of all of the ideas about what Isaiah was talking about, Jesus is the only one who's still around today. Jesus Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. And I hope your trust is in him and not in any people or any building or any place. What Jesus said is the measure of anything said by anyone else. What he did on the cross is the defining moment of history. There's no other event that is more important. Who he is is everything that we are and everything we want to be. I hope your trust is in Jesus this morning. Because everybody needs a place to stand. We all need a place where we can put our trust, something that is going to be sure and solid, something that we don't have to wonder about. Is that going to come through or not? We all need a place to stand, and we try to stand in all different kinds of places. People will make their foundation their strength, their own strength to accomplish tasks or their intelligence to solve problems, or money to meet needs and wants. Just in last year's election, for example, the number one important issue for voters was the economy. That was the number one important issue 
for voters in the last election. That beat out terrorism, health care, immigration, and abortion even. So we put our trust in, in money, in the economy. Where we want that to be our place to stand. We have relationships that we will put our trust in. And if you, if you don't believe me, try telling a, a young person who's just so in love that maybe you two aren't right for each other. And watch them explode. Or a job. People get personal meaning and fulfillment from their jobs. My dad worked in an office furniture company his, his entire career, and he would always be astounded at how important office furniture was. People would be flying off the handle by, because just one part was missing on one piece in an entire order. And my dad would be like, Guys, this is just office furniture here. But if your job is where you get your meaning and your purpose, if that's where your feet are standing as your solid rock, then these little things are catastrophes. The torrents of a fallen world will test each of our foundations. Where we're standing. This, this world is not a stable place. It's changing. It's shifting. There's lots of hazards. Our strength is easily taken. Accident, disease, and age, we're going to get weaker. Intelligence regularly fails. We have blind spots. We have knowledge gaps. And we have overconfidence. I have a whole book on my shelf. It's really a fun read, actually. It says, it seemed like a good idea. And it goes through all of these episodes in history where there were some really smart people who thought, okay, this is the way to go. And how it turned out to be a disaster. Sometimes it was obvious and sometimes it really did seem like a good idea. But intelligence will fail us. And we'll have disasters. Money is easily lost. If you lose a job or you make one bad investment... Gambling addiction or identity theft, your money's gone. Relationships often break up. This last year, we had, in this country, we had over 800,000 divorces. That's not even including California and Georgia and some other states. If marriages break up, how much do other relationships break up? Jobs are easily terminated, they're outsourced and downsized. We can't really stand up on our job very well either. And then there's this one torrent of life that will get us all. It's called death. We're all going to die someday. And no matter what your foundation is, there's no cure for death. Only one foundation can deliver from death. Just one. It's the one that we proclaim, that we talk about. So John eleven twenty five, 25, I have it on the screen here. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Jesus, his foundation is so strong that he can even deliver you from death. So that even if your heart stops beating and you have no more brain waves, you will still live. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? That's his promise. If you trust in him, you will not be disappointed, according to Isaiah. Let's look at the screen here together. And let's answer this. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because he saves us from our sins, salvation cannot be found in anyone else. It is futile to look for any salvation elsewhere. There's only one Savior in this world. There's only one place where we can stand. There's only one sure foundation, and that's Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 46, if you have your Bible open, 
that says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So if you were here today and you call Jesus your Lord, do you do what he says? Do you, do you hear what he's saying and do you, do you do it? Or do you just hear it and you think, oh, that's nice, I'll make up my own mind. I was looking around, I found this, this survey that showed that practicing Christians, that means that people who call themselves a Christian attend religious services at least once a month and say religion is very important to them. 41% of these people, practicing Christians, would say whatever is right for your life or works best for you is the only truth you can know. Whatever is right for you or works best for you is the only truth you can know? That's, that's the bottom line for truth is just whatever works for you? There's a lot of people who say, Lord, Lord, and hang their hat on something else. They're standing somewhere else. The words, Lord, Lord, they're repeating there. That means emphasis. There's, there's kind of this, Lord, Lord, kind of, a, kind of a connotation with that. Your foundation is shown not by how you feel towards Jesus, but by your obedience. So maybe you're here today and you think, oh, Jesus, he's a good guy, I like him. He has good things to say, I, I, I listen to him. Maybe you have, just have good feelings towards him. But do you listen to what he says? Do you obey him? That's your foundation. Lots of people have good feelings towards Jesus. But do you do what he says? The cadet verse, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. This parable here, that we just read, this is at the end of the Sermon on the Plain. It's kind of Luke's equivalent to the Sermon on the Mount. So what did Jesus command that he wants us to listen and obey what he says? If you look back at this sermon, which you will in the Bible reading tracks this week, what do we say? What do our words say? How were your words in this last week? Do our words reflect Christ or a sinful heart? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What kind of words have you said this past week? Could they be described as what is loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled? Or not? We like to think that sticks and stones will break our bones, but words will never hurt me. Words are a big deal to God. They're a big deal. Out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. What's in your heart? It'll show in what you say. We go a little farther back in his sermon there. When was the last time we took a plank from our own eye? It's easy to see those specks in other people's eyes and say, boy, they've got something wrong with them. They're not seeing straight. Look at that speck there. And we got this big old log in our own eye. We think we can see fine and other people can't see. But when was the last time we actually took a log out of our own eye? We have things that maybe we say that we're working on. But do we actually work on them? Are we actually taking a log out of our eye? Or do we just have it on a list of things that, eh, we're not optimally set? Do we point out flaws in ourselves as much as we do in others? Jesus has something to say about that. You'll read about it this week. How do we treat our enemies? There's a lot of awful people in this world and they treat other people terribly. They treat us terribly. They say things that are terrible. 
they do things that are terrible. And we don't even have terrorists that are around us that much. It's not like we live in the Middle East where there's terrorism all the time, or even like Europe where there's been a lot of terrorism recently. There's a lot of terrible people in this world. How do we treat the people who are mean to us? It's easy to love people who love us back. It's easy to love your family and your friends. But Jesus says, so what? Everybody does that. What difference does that make? When Jesus came here, he came to be with and teach and die for sinners. His enemies. That's us. Being like Christ doesn't mean loving the people who love you back. It means loving people who are terrible to you. Now, what that exactly looks like can be kind of complicated because if you just do whatever all the mean people want you to do, that's not necessarily loving them. But if there's a need there, do you respond to it? Or do you just say, oh, too bad for you, you deserve it. Do our lives look like the radical way of Jesus? Jesus lived his life very differently than we do. How do our lives match his? He had a whole different set of priorities. He looked at things entirely differently than we do. What do our lives look like? Do they look like everybody else's? Or do we look differently? Do we have a different set of priorities? Do we treat people differently? Do we look at money and food and family differently? Do we make sure that we're making time for God in all of our busyness? You would never build a house without a foundation. But would you build your day without prayer? Would you set out into your day without asking God to be with you, without praying about the things that are on your to-do list? Would you live your day without a prayer? Without praying about it? It's easy to do when you're in a hurry, isn't it? but maybe that needs to be the foundation of your day, to give what you have on your list to do to God in prayer. Or would you make up your mind without searching God's word? We think, oh, I, I, can, I can figure this one out on my own. When you have a decision to make, do you look at what God's word has to say? Do you study it? Do you look for answers there? So build each day on the rock of Jesus. Build your life on him, but build each day on him too. Don't set out based on your own intelligence or your own strength or your own resources. Give your days, each day, to God in prayer. Ask him to take it. Build your day on the foundation that he is. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God in heaven, Lord, you've shown us your way, and it's a very different way than, than what we tend to go. So Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us, that we would have a change of heart, that we would act like Jesus Christ in all things. Please equip us to do that by your Spirit, and lead us along your ways so that each day we give to you in prayer and through searching your word. We pray In Jesus' name, amen.